Good afternoon, party people. It is a little bit of a hazy afternoon here in San Diego. Uh, sitting watching the planes go by. And so thought I'd uh, pop in and answer some of your questions uh, from over on PollGab. The number one question you had about SQL Server that y'all voted for each other. Carl asks, oh, this is going to get me in trouble. Hi, Brent. What is your opinion of the graph database support starting in SQL Server 2017? Is this another doomed SQL feature? And I assume that he means by doomed, something that doesn't get any adoption and doesn't get any improvement. Uh, and so SQL Server has a lot of those where they're kind of one and done features. And if they don't meet your needs in the first version, then you should probably stay away from them. I don't know anybody who adopted a graph in SQL Server 2017. And the people that I know who tried it uh, seemed like they ran into showstopper issues relatively quickly. Um, I don't know if, uh, I don't know anything about it more than that. Um, I don't think I've heard anything about it coming in SQL Server 2022, like anything that's massively improved or different. So the way that I would say it is, if the features don't meet your needs as is, as of SQL Server 2019, then you probably shouldn't implement it. It's not to say Microsoft's never going to make any improvements to it, but just given the really low adoption rate that I've seen, I wouldn't bank on a future for it when there are open source competitors. If you're building a brand new application based on a graph database today, you should, or based on graph needs, you should probably go with a graph database because there's open source ones out there that are free as opposed to spending big money for SQL Server when it's, a re it's not really the focus of this platform. Next up, Bob asks, Hi Brent, sometimes when we run SP Blitz Cache for a given stored procedure, the top result set says we couldn't find a plan for this query, but the bottom result set shows prioritized findings. Can the bottom set uh, still re be relied on? So the bottom set functions as a decoder ring for the warnings that we saw up at the top. For example, if in the top it says, hey, you're filtering with a scalar user-defined function in this query, then the second result set says, here's what that means. Well, if we didn't fire a warning up at the top because we couldn't find a plan for the query, then it's not like we're going to magically be able to make something up in the bottom. The bottom result set only shows the details of what was in the top result set. Next up, Juggler314 asks, my friend has some old tables with no great candidates for a clustered index. Is it better to use something like a timestamp, which may not be unique, or just add an auto-incremented internal column to be the key? So whenever you say there are no great candidates for a clustered index, that makes me think that we haven't defined what makes a row unique. Uh, so that, that worries me there just as a starting point. And I'd probably ask bigger questions about, okay, what, what is it about each row that makes it unique? That's not to say that that's always a good clustering candidate, but it usually is. Because even if you don't cluster on that, you're probably going to need an index on that. However, if you've got the uh, iron fist where you can... Uh, make changes to the tables any times you want, it's hard to go wrong with adding an identity column. Uh, it, it's not impossible to go wrong, but it's fairly hard to go wrong. Uh, so you can do that as a last resort. The other thing to do is pick up Lewis Davidson's book, Relational Data Modeling. Uh, Lewis Davidson, Relational Data Modeling. And that'll help uh, start to have discussions with the developers about, okay, what is it that makes a row unique here? And when you say old tables, the other thing is, well, I, I, I was, I'm tempted to not say this. Make sure you focus your efforts on the thing that's going to give you the bang for the buck. Um, if it's an old table that you don't use anymore, uh, that's not actively developed as part of the application, then who cares? Just kind of move on. Uh, but if it is something that you're actively relying on as a core part of your application, go figure out what makes a row unique, because that's kind of important. Jim says, hi Brent, do you have any recommended one-stop tools or scripts 
that capture server configuration, database files, settings, memory configuration, OS version, SQL version, etc., for disaster recovery purposes. Um, I, I don't because I don't do the production database administration side as, anymore, but you should check out DBA Tools. DBAtools.io is a PowerShell framework that has all kinds of stuff to make it easier to move servers from one place to another. I don't know this, but I can only assume that because they make copying servers so easy, they probably have a copy all the scripts out to commands that make it easy. The thing that I would just say is, it's so easy today to stand up SQL servers in the cloud, even if you shut them down while you're not using them. The beauty of setting them up ahead of time and just turning them off and not paying for hourly usage, at least I, I, I know Amazon lets you do that. I'm not sure about Microsoft Azure. I would think that they would have to. Um, but for, for AWS, my clients just only have to pay for server costs uh, for storage. It's not like you have to pay for compute time when the thing's not actively up and running. It's so cheap now that it's just smart to go set those SQL servers up ahead of time, test that they're working, do a failover back and forth. And then if you can't afford the compute cost, which is fair because it's expensive, uh, then shut them down. But at least that way you've got the work done ahead of time. Because otherwise, I've seen people who are like, yeah, our plan is to rebuild every SQL server from scratch. And I'm like, how? H how are you going to do that when disaster strikes in a day or two with a limited number of staff when usually during a disaster, you have other problems? Fire ran through your offices or there was a hurricane in the area or an earthquake in the area. And half your staff is going to be unreachable you know, trying to do things like fine-tuned configuration of networking subnets is going to be freaking impossible when Alice is trying to save her, you know, get her kids out of preschool due to the forest fires, and Bob is trying to put, you know, shutters up on his home. You know, it's, it's do as much as you can ahead of time. I'm probably preaching to the choir because if you're 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 the kind of person who's pr uh, proactively trying to fix this, right? You're you're proactively trying to gather this information, so you're you're probably in uh, camp proactive. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ken asks a hard one. Ken asks, is there a good way to handle multi-database backups and restores when the transactions span multiple databases? You asked if there's a good way. No. Is there a way? Yes. If you check out how Microsoft BizSpark, B-I-Z-S-P-A-R-K, Microsoft's BizSparks documentation deals with that exact problem. Uh, so if you re read up on how to restore, how to backup and restore Microsoft BizTalk databases, what they do is they insert marked transactions periodically, marked transactions across multiple databases, and then when it's time to restore, you stop at those marked transactions. Like you do a marked transaction, woo! That was a big old boom. Something just... Oh, it's the cannon over there. You might... I don't know that you saw that, but there's a uh, there's an old tall ship here that's uh, just fired off a cannon. You'll probably see it here in a second because the ship's going that way. Uh, you insert a marked transaction, say, every five minutes, and when it's time to restore, you restore to one of those marked transactions and stop. That's how BizSpark does it. Uh, I don't know that it's still clean that you wouldn't lose data across... Uh, other transactions, but at least that should get you closer. Um, the other, I would be, I'd be a bad consultant if I didn't mention the other thing you can, that somebody's going to suggest that you can do is snapshots. If you do uh, uh, storage level snapshots using Microsoft VSS uh, that are volume snapshots that will snap all of the databases at the exact same time, somebody's going to say that that works. That's true in the sense that it gets all the files as of the same time, but when SQL Server goes to attach those database backups, it may roll some database transactions forward in some databases and backwards in other databases. It's not really cross-database aware in a situation like that. Uh, okay, so that at least gets us pretty close. Uh, next up, Drowning in SQL Pool asks, Hi, Brent. When it comes time to upgrading compatibility levels on databases, 
after you've left an upgrade stew for a few weeks. So what he's talking about is when I, I coach people to upgrade their SQL servers, I say just leave the old compat levels as is for a couple few weeks so that uh, people don't pin the blame on compat level changes because whenever you do an upgrade people are like oh my god my SQL server used to be so fast and now it's so terribly slow and I'm like no your, your SQL server was always slow. He says, should you upgrade system databases? You don't have a choice with things like master. Those are automatically upgraded to the current compat level. So you, good news, you don't have to screw around with that. Next up, Chris asks, hi Brent, what are the pros and cons of using NUMA-based servers for bare metal SQL? Okay, oh, this, is, this is BS. Um, there are people out there who overthink uh, the overhead of multiple NUMA nodes for a SQL server. Keep things simple. How many cores of power do you need? Buy that many. Don't buy more than you need. SQL Server Standard Edition is $2,000 per, per CPU core. Enterprise Edition is $7,000 a CPU core. Don't buy CPU power you don't need, and you kind of stay out of that problem. If your application only needs four cores to get its job done, that gives you an idea of how much you should spend. If you need 30 CPU cores to get your job done, your, your options are going to be relatively limited as to how many CPUs uh, sockets that you uh, want to use. It's not like it's really common to it's not like it's really common to use say a one socket 30 core SQL server because the more cores that you add in one socket the slower the CPU clock goes so you'll see people buying if you need 30 CPUs worth of power you'll see people buy two socket systems so that each of those sockets has as few cores as possible going as quickly as possible and don't overthink the NUMA node stuff uh, in an effort to get the last 5%, and even 5% is a stretch, of uh, performance out of it. All right, next up, Todd asks, Hi Brent, do you know of anyone successfully using Stretch Database? No. Uh, and is Microsoft still pushing this, as in making enhancements, bug fixes, etc.? No, the feature when they brought it out, uh, the feature that when they brought out Stretch Databases, the idea is that you would have your current data in your SQL Server and you would push the old archive data up to Azure. And in theory, there are parts of that that vaguely make sense because people don't ever want to delete anything these days. They want to keep all their data around forever. The problem was the pricing. The, the first problem was the pricing. The pricing was horrific if you go price it out. It doesn't make sense for any kind of serious amount. Let's say that you're worried about archiving a terabyte, terabyte worth of SQL Server data. It just doesn't make financial sense. Uh, it, that's an easy problem for Microsoft to fix. They could fix that. They so far have chosen not to. It just hasn't been a priority and I don't know why. Um, the second part to that was, if you needed to edit any of that data, you needed to bring it back across the network wire locally and then push it back up again up to the cloud, which led to huge transaction log problems. A lot of people say, in theory, oh yeah, no, we're totally done with changing that. We'll never change it again. And then, oh, my bad, we need to add a column to that table, you know, and then all hell breaks loose. Uh, so I would wait to see that they fix the cost problem before I even look at the technical problems, which are significant if you ever change the data. All right, let's see here. How long have we been going? Oh, we've been going like 15 minutes already. We should probably call it quits there. I always get worried when I lecture y'all for too long and throw too many uh, questions inside a single video. Um, so for those of you who pay really close attention to office hours, you'll note that I'm back in San Diego. This is, I'm recording this on January the 16th, uh, Sunday, and uh, this coming weekend I'm going back down to Cabo. I uh, was, my original plan was that I was going to stay up here in San Diego for like a month um, and do my training classes from up here. I have consulting and training classes that I have to do this month. 
Um, but I couldn't believe how fast the internet was down in Cabo. The condo building that I moved into has fiber optic internet. So this weekend, this coming weekend, I'm going to move back down there for a while and try teaching classes out of there. If it works successfully, I'm just going to stay down there uh, until I can't tolerate the heat anymore. Cabo gets really hot in the summer times, uh, and I'm not sure how hot I'll want to get. Plus, their, their electricity rates go up by 4x during the daytime. Like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. in Cabo, the electricity rates go up by 4x. They have to generate all their own electricity. They do it with diesel. Uh, which always kind of struck me as kind of odd because it, it's a land of like unlimited sunshine. It seems like it would be perfect for solar, but they just haven't adopted solar yet. During the summer, uh, electricity needs are so high because everybody wants to run the air conditioning. So they do these giant electric rate jumps. And I, I haven't gotten a straight answer out of a lot of people about uh, wh what the rates are really going to look like for air conditioning in the condo building that I'm in. Uh, so you hear people yelling and screaming every now and then. They get a thousand or two thousand dollar electric bill in one month. So I, I want to see how hot it gets and where my own heat tolerance is and where I go for air conditioning. Um, and if it's that hot, too hot to be outside and miserable, then I'll uh, look at uh, coming back here or doing something else. Well, that wraps up today's episode of Office Hours. I will uh, go polish off this bottle of champagne, and I will see you all later. Adios. <laughs> There's a parade going on downstairs. <laughs>